Hey everyone, it is me, John Lorden. And me, Danielle Hallen. Welcome back. Welcome back to episode 24 of Crime After Crime. Can you believe that, Danielle? I cannot believe it. Like, at all. I remember coming up with this idea. I don't know where two years have gone. Yeah, I know. Especially because January and February felt like at least two years in themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I feel like every month this year has felt like it's just going very, so very slow. Long. Do you remember back in 2019 where you would go, oh, my God, I can't believe it's April. Oh, my God, I can't believe it's August. Oh, my yeah. God, I can't. And That's I genuinely not happening. felt like that every time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It felt like that for every year previous. This year, not feeling like that. Nope, not at all. Not whatsoever. <laughs> oh, um, well, of course, as usual, we have to start with our voting results with Danielle for the last episode, Solved by Psychic. And boy, was it a close one. You ready, Danielle? Oh my gosh, I'm ready. <laughs> what? Okay, guys. What is she laughing at? A very close one. Either I can't do math well, <laughs> or something fishy is going on here. Uh -oh. But on Twitter... I received 78% of the votes wow. with John coming in next at 22%. Woo, last place. I love it. <laughs> My favorite place to be. <laughs> and then on YouTube, I received 82% of the votes and John received 18%. Yeah, I guess we should change that. It was actually at our website, but yeah. Um, oh yeah, that's right. Correction. Not, yeah, not that I'm trying to overshadow your, your victory, Danielle, um, <laughs> but wow. I'm telling you, it's because I knew. I was like, look, we're getting to the nitty gritty here. <laughs> Things are getting serious and I've got, to, I've got to win one to at least tie at this point. Well, I have to say, I have a lawyer drafting up a letter for Troy because I'm pretty sure the failure of Troy and his psychic abilities let me down on last episode, <laughs> but... This is all your fault. I paid you to your play fault. a game with me. You told me your story would work. Yeah. I th <laughs> Come on, Troy. I thought you were a psychic. You should have told me it was going to go this way. <laughs> um, honestly, I can't knock it because I had a great time with that episode. That's I thought, a good one. Yeah, I thought we had a bunch of good laughs. And who knows? I might hire Troy some time to play bingo with us. It's Nothing's out of the pos realm of possibility. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> That would so, be hilarious. Danielle, where are our totals for season two? So right now, season two totals, we are tied. It is five for me and five for John. Wow. And this is the last episode of season two. So this is going to decide it. Today's episode is going to decide it. And a big thank you to everyone that mm -hmm. is doing the new voting system yeah. over at crimeaftercrimepodcast.com. Over a thousand of you jumped over there. Awesome. Thank know, you so much. Really cool. Yeah. I was nervous about it. We spent so long speaking about the eye, so. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I guess I need to hand this over to you. Are Please you ready? Do. I'm ready for it. Fill it with lots of coffee. I'm tired today. Here you go. Coming to you. You have it. Mmm. Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> I now have my coffee cup back. Well, today we are looking at worst dates ever. Now, these are dates that are involving some sort of criminal aspect. Of course, some of the worst dates ever are featured on the show Deadly Dates, which you can watch right now on today's sponsor, Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a streaming service founded by filmmakers with a passion for producing and curating the best content out there. History, science, space, nature, and of course, true crime, it's all waiting for you on Magellan TV. They also have some amazing shows like Deadly Dates. Dating in the internet era is easier than ever, but is it also riskier? Deadly Dates explores cases where swiping right might mean swiping wrong. Each episode dives deep into the details of a specific case, in both a respectful and comprehensive way. It wasn't just them telling a story, I learned how to protect myself. Deadly Dates is another perfect example of how Magellan TV provides top-notch content. Magellan TV works on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, iOS. You can watch it on your TV, laptop, or mobile device anytime, anywhere. With more than 2,000 documentaries and new content being added weekly, including 4K content at no additional cost, why wouldn't you give Magellan TV a try? Crime After Crime viewers can try it out for free. Visit try.magellantv.com slash crimeaftercrime and you'll get a one month free trial. There's nothing left to lose. Give Magellan TV a try for free and thank them for sponsoring Crime After Crime at the same time. Visit try.magellantv.com slash crimeaftercrime today. All right, Danielle. Now, before we start today's stories, 
I think it's really important to clearly state that some people might have a criminal past, but maybe they've learned from their mistakes. Okay. Now, the people that we're talking about in today's cases, hmm, maybe not so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not so much for mine. <laughs> YourTango.com expert Christopher Smith, a marriage and family therapist, wrote an article titled Four Reasons You Might Want to Date a Criminal. And number one on their list is exactly what John said. The crime is in the past, and we've all made mistakes in our lives. According to the article, many criminals are not involved in crime after their release. There are programs that attempt rehabilitation of criminals, or for some, just the experience of dealing with their crime is enough to make lasting change. Now, number two on his list was they don't have a criminal mind. Now, Danielle, I could tell by your expression. <laughs> this I criminal thought, does not have a criminal mind. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was kind of weird, too, because I'm like, well, how do you test if they have a criminal mind or not? Uh, the point that they're trying to make is if something is done that is not clearly a crime or if it's like a hard to understand crime, for example, a crime related to copyright infringement or investment law, maybe you'd find that more understanding and less offensive than, say, an assault charge. They have this statement called out in bold that is clearly giving advice to those single ladies out there. Don't write off a date just because of a pesky little criminal record. He could be the one. Um, <clears throat> have we looked into this author's criminal background? Because I'm pretty sure there's a folder somewhere out there with his name on it. I think you're right. But, but Danielle, he could be the one. He could be the one. Yeah. <laughs> you uh, never know. <laughs> number three states that breaking the law was actually a good thing. Essentially, that the views of the crime line up with your belief system, which isn't necessarily a terrible point to make. What is terrible is the example they use in the article. If you believe in the right to die, you may be attracted to someone that has been convicted under assisted suicide laws. Nope. Check, please. I was about to say, need to leave. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Number four states... They really did not commit the crime. Well, I'm telling you, that really opens up the field. I personally, you know, I hear inmates say that all the time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I didn't do it. I didn't do it. <laughs> Thankfully, Christopher ends his piece with a final thought. While discovering your potential date as a criminal may often be a deal breaker, there are cases where you should still consider whether you want to date them. In fact, there are even situations where their crime or the situation around their crime should enhance your interest in them. Now, honestly, I do appreciate not judging people automatically and giving someone a second chance. Your mileage may vary on some of the other tips that we've talked about with oh, this. Yeah. But uh, thank you, you tango expert Christopher Smith, who I understand is available to date and any interested ladies can find his photo on mugshots.com. Oh, good grief. <laughs> now... On to our first story of the day. Danielle, please tell us about one of the worst dates ever. Buckle in, you guys. Buckle in, because this might be one of the craziest stories that I have ever found. Now, dating, first dates in particular, can be scary. I'm pretty sure we can all agree on that. But usually our fears are along the lines of, what if they don't like me? What if I'm overdressed? Will my laugh be too annoying? What if I talk about true crime too much? I don't know. Some people don't like to. I don't know. You know, we can all relate to that. Every single person here is like, don't bring up serial killers. Don't bring up serial killers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. But a man named Wilson Edward Jackson took those fears and knocked them out of the park. He is quite possibly the worst and last first date that many women would ever go on. And not in the way that I'm sure most of you guys are thinking about. This all started or at least came to light with a woman named Acacia and all these names in here, there's a lot going on. They're either fake names or I'm not going to be giving last names. Okay. Um, but Acacia was a 37 year old, nine year retired Air Force veteran living in Arizona. She was a busy independent woman, didn't make a lot of time for men in her life. So when an unknown man named Will Jackson popped up in her friend request on Facebook in 2017, she did accept, but she didn't think much past that. Until she suddenly got a message from him in her inbox with the words, What's up, beautiful? Mm -hmm. These first lines, they're... I'm Slid you, they into me. that DM. <laughs> I was yeah. about to say, wow, blew me off my feet. 
<laughs> now, typically, Acacia would ignore this, but Will seemed like a nice guy. Through browsing his page, he was attractive. He dressed very well, typically an all-designer head-to-toe. Important to remember that. Mm -hmm. And she figured that there was no harm in saying hello. But little did she know this would turn her world entirely upside down for years. It started off as friendly conversation. They had mutual friends, so that was kind of a topic. They both had an interest in football. They, you know, got along very well. He seemed very appreciative of her nine years she served in the Air Force. He was respectful. He was positive. He seemed to have his life together. Will told Acacia that he owned a solar energy business in California. He had a place in L.A. He just seemed like an overall, you know, put-together man. Yeah. So they really hit it off. They spoke for a few weeks just through text, FaceTime, and phone calls, and it turned into a romantic relationship. Will was the kind of man that made you feel like you were the center of the universe. Around Christmas, Acacia had plans to be with a friend to celebrate, but last minute this friend ditched the plans. She was pretty upset. This meant she'd be alone on Christmas, but like a knight in shining armor, Will came in and saved the day. He offered to buy her a plane ticket to come and visit him in L.A. And at this point, they'd never seen each other. They'd never actually been on a date. Okay. He told her, you know, it's no big deal at all. You can come, fly in midday, stay the night, fly back the next day. It'll at least get your you know, mind off of these plans. You won't miss work. It'll be good. Now, Acacia being who she was, very hesitant at first. But then she ended up getting encouragement from one of her friends saying, you know, there's no reason to, reason to be worried. He seems like a nice guy. You've been talking to him for weeks at this point. You can always leave if you need to. So she decided, hey, let's live life on the edge and fly to L.A. to have a date with this man. So he sent her a plane ticket. And on a Friday in December, she headed out for her trip. This is December 2017. Right. But she quickly hit a roadblock. Now, had there been any other red flags... This one may have stuck out a little bit more, but because Will portrayed himself as this innocent, caring, giving man, this was easily explained away. The plane ticket that he gave her, according to the airline, was fake. Uh. <laughs> yes. It was fake. Now, in a flurry of calls back and forth, which, by the way, he stated that it was not fake, they must have been having issues. How do you even was... fake a ticket? Like, I, it's a barcode. Like, there's a system that verifies it. Like, what... <laughs> I honestly have no clue, but I'm telling you the links this man went to, you're not gonna this is not gonna be the first shocking thing that you hear. Oh my goodness. But they finally agreed that Acacia would simply buy another ticket with her own money for the same plane, and then once she got to LA, Will would reimburse her for the flight. After all, again, he owns this solar energy business in California. He's gotta be making some money. Sure. And he exactly, and he even sent a photo of himself to her, a selfie, at a Wells Fargo bank claiming that he was speaking with a banker right then and there to make sure that he had her money back right away. So there was no reason to be worried. Okay. From there on it seemed like a dream. Will picked a K shot from the airport, they went to a nice dinner, they followed that up with a movie. Um, I'm pretty sure she wrote a check or something to or he wrote a check to reimburse her. Uh, she stayed the night at his home, and then the next morning, she was even awoken by a beautiful homemade breakfast. Okay. Midday Saturday, she was taken back to the airport, returned home. The following Sunday morning, she woke up to her typical good morning text from Will, but what seemed like an amazing real first date turned into an absolute nightmare by Monday morning. Acacia woke up to $3,000 missing from her bank account, and she definitely was not the one to spend it. Upon further investigation, she saw that there was a small charge at a fast food restaurant in California, a plane ticket from Dallas to LA, but majority of the money, two and a half thousand of it, was a wire transfer. Uh-oh. So Acacia obviously called the police where she lived, and they redirected her to LA police, and then LA police redirected her back to local police, and it was a mess, and no one seemed to want to help her. And using investigative skills and a pretty good gut feeling, she came to the conclusion that Will was responsible for this. He was the mm -hmm. only connection that she had to L.A., let alone California. The fact that she was just with him, this man that she knew but also kind of didn't know. And all of a sudden, these charges from California are popping up. She just knew. She yeah. said that she had all of her cards with her. You know, nothing was stolen. So she believed that he had taken pictures of all of her debit and credit cards while she showered or slept that night because those were the only two times that she was ever away from those items. Oh my goodness. Mm hmm So Acacia from this point became her own detective and essentially, without even realizing it, ended up helping solve a nationwide dating crime spree. I know. You're like, what does that even mean? I, well, I was... <laughs> is it like, hold on, I'm just curious, does Will have partners or is, is he the nationwide 
ringleader? Is he just robbing women all over the nation? Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. So Acacia, once finding this information out, couldn't get in contact with Will. You know, she, of course, wants to call him and be like, why did you spend this much of my money? But he had blocked her on every single platform that she followed him on, which just confirmed in her mind that he was the culprit. And because it was a heat of the moment situation, she wasn't familiar with L.A. He drove. He was the one who picked her up. She couldn't remember the address where he lived or really much information. The only thing that she remembered was that the buildings were tall around his home, which, I mean, it's L.A. LA. (laughs) (laughs) They had to park in an underground garage, which, again, is L.A. Yeah. And... They were very close to a movie theater they went to that night. And at this point, she gave Greg Hughes a run for his money because she used Google Maps. Yeah. (laughs) In L.A. Awesome. She was looking for areas that fit that criteria. Mm -hmm. Once she narrowed it down to a few places, she used apartment floor plans online to fully confirm where she had stayed with Will. Now, at this point, she's like, I'm calling the building. I'm going to explain the situation to them, get his address, get his you know, full name, anything I can so I can fully file charges against him. Mm-hmm. But she was shocked when the apartment complex said, nobody under the name of Will Jackson's living here. Yeah. So things just went from, oh, this guy took me on a date to steal my money to, wait a minute, whose house was I in? Was it even his house? Is Will even his name? Right. So Acacia decided to do some more sleuthing. She took photos that she had of him from different areas of social media where she followed him, and she reverse image searched them, which, ironically enough, she learned to do while watching the show Catfished. Yes. (laughs) Exactly. We're learning here. Yep. (laughs) And this led her to a profile with a picture of Will. She was familiar with this picture, but not the name on the account. The name on the account was Sincere. John Lorden. (laughs) Surprise! (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> name on the account was sincere jackson okay so when she used that name for another search to see if that would lead her to any more information she came upon a shocking article from 2011 orlando police were looking for information particularly victims of a man that went under the name sincere jackson they described this man as a charmer that would lure women in for dates steal from them and leave them hanging Acacia was basically hearing her own story of her own experience with Will, but this happened across the country in 2011, and this is 2017 at this point. It was so specific that they said that this man always picked up single, attractive, well-off women on Facebook, somehow drained their bank accounts without ever taking their card, so the women didn't notice until it was way too late. Who on earth was this man? So at this point, Acacia's in contact with the police department in Orlando and the police department in L.A., who told her that one of their detectives, her first name's Stephanie, so I'm calling her Detective Stephanie. The last name I can't pronounce for the life of me. So, (laughs) So Stephanie had been following this case for a while. She was assigned to the case in early 2016 when a string of women came forward accusing this man that they'd figured out was, you know, Wilson Jackson. Um, They were accusing him of fraud and theft and this ended up leading to the discovery of similar charges all across the united states at this point i believe she only had eight victims um and i say only because whoa just wait this basically she wanted two more to come forward she didn't feel comfortable that she had enough people to you know really arrest him and get him in jail for as long as he probably needed to be a lot of these women were just too scared you know she she knew there were victims but they didn't want to speak to her so acacia decided to help out and she began to publicly post and search for other victims of will he went under multiple different names across social media with dozens and dozens of fake profiles he had dating accounts set up, and it was all to trick women into going on a date with him so he could steal all of the, their financial information to live the lifestyle that he did. Keep in mind when I said, oh, he wears all designer. Right, right. Um, two of the main dating sites that he seemed to use, and this is important because they're still looking for victims, are Plenty of Fish and Black People Meet. Mm-hmm. And he went under names ranging from Will to Wilson to Sincere to Da Truth, like D A, and I think it was even like T R U O O T H. Okay. And Outlaw. And it's likely that there are even more that have yet to be discovered. Acacia ended up meeting with women all over the country in search of answers to hand over to Orlando and LA police. And she was able to gain these women's trust by letting them understand, you know, I was one of his victims as well. We have to stop him from harming anyone else. 
the pieces of the puzzle started to come together and it became very clear that Wilson had been doing this for a ridiculously long time. Wilson Jackson was born in Daytona Beach. He had a pretty average upbringing and a religious and very strict family. He attended a community college in another state briefly before ending up back in Florida with plans to enroll in a local college. Uh Uh-oh, he's a Florida man? Yes. (laughs) Yes, he sure is. Okay. (laughs) Surprise. (laughs) But instead of enrolling into this local college, he immediately began his leeching and criminal behaviors. So this means he started conning people out of money, women in particular, in the early 2000s. So this man had been doing this for two decades. Wow. He would go from girlfriend to girlfriend or friend to friend using their money to get into apartment leases where they would eventually be evicted because of his failure to pay. So he even actually stole a good female friend's name and her financial information in an attempt to get a car and a credit line. Um, And this is kind of how he all started, was by doing this, getting these girlfriends. And, you know, he would live with them, but he would leech off them while they were there. Um, He would leech off of his friends. And he only ended up in California when Florida started to catch on to what he was doing. Mm -hmm. His girlfriends and ex-girlfriends did what everyone's worst nightmare is. They started to work together. (laughs) (laughs) They were putting pieces together. They made complaints with his parole officer. They even went to the extent of warning any female seen with him. They even spoke to some of these women's parents in an effort Mm -hmm. to save them from his crimes. And the unfortunate thing about this story is that he actually had been caught a handful of times. He had met a complete stranger in a bar in Florida, charmed her, stole her credit card, used said credit card, had the audacity to ask her on a second date where he returned this credit card, as if nothing had happened. Obviously, she ended up charging him. He was ordered to pay back everything that he bought on her card. Another woman was one of his girlfriends. He used her credit card to buy $1,000 in plane tickets. When this went to court, he even argued, saying that she had authorized it, but ultimately, he was also told to pay her back. That makes me wonder about the plane ticket that he bought to get her out there. I wonder if he had bought it using someone else's stolen card and then the charge got reversed. Because that would make more sense than, you know, trying to fake a plane ticket. Just wait. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the first things that Acacia, it's funny you said that, decided to do was use the payment made on her card for the flight from Dallas to LA to narrow down if that was his next victim. Sure enough, it was. None other than a Dallas police officer that he had conned. (laughs) This Dallas police officer had met him like these other women online. They had been speaking for weeks. So while he was still speaking to Acacia and they had a very similar first date to the one Acacia had a flight out to L.A. ending in financial theft. Now, using the information from police about his whereabouts, since this seems to be a pattern, Acacia started to search using the same method she did to track down his aliases to hopefully find other victims, and it led her to another one through a blog. This victim in particular is incredibly heartbreaking and stuck out a lot. It really proved how little Wilson actually cared, despite tricking these women into thinking they were absolutely everything to him. Um, An unnamed woman, she did not want her name to be released to the public, met him at the age of 22 while attending Texas A&M University in 2011. She had been diagnosed with cancer, like just diagnosed. And between treatment and being in school and being far away from family, she was going through some of the biggest changes in her life, and she really relied on Wilson. He was pretty much the only person that she had. She told him absolutely everything. He was always there to answer the phone. She said he was, you know, he would drop everything. He seemed to listen and he seemed to be genuine. But unfortunately, months into this relationship, Wilson started his plan. He claimed that he lost his debit card. And at this point, he was in the process of moving back to Orlando from California. And he said that he just needed some money to get by. So he said, um, someone, I, and I'm being serious. He literally said, someone is going to deposit a check into your account. (laughs) And he said, once this check goes in, I need you to go down, wire transfer it to this account. (laughs) The total was $1,900. And she did exactly what he asked with this imaginary amount of money. (laughs) She didn't realize until later on that day when she got her nails done that her bank account was overdrawn because of a bounced check. And I'm sure you can guess when she tried to contact Wilson about it, he disappeared and she was blocked across the board. Wow. Now, this woman was already in such a scary spot. She was paying for cancer treatment. She was paying for college. She needed that money. She's done a couple of like different blurred out interviews. 
He pretended to care about her for months to scam her out of $2,000. And to make it worse, when she went to the police to report this, they told her, oh yeah, we have plenty of other complaints about this guy, but technically you agreed to cash the check or, you know, do the wire transfer and have the check in your account, so it's your fault. Right, right. Wow. Wow. Acacia gathered enough traction that even victims began to reach out to her. 28-year-old Kiara Miller from California said that in February of 2018, shortly after Acacia was conned, she was also conned by Wilson. She said that they went out on their first date, but he claimed his bank card wasn't working. So he said, hey, can you deposit two of these checks into your bank account and then wire the money to me? The story sounds familiar, and it ended just the same. Kira it's noticed, like yeah. that's like a that's like a small version of like the Nigerian scam. Like the yeah. you get an email about hey we've got all this money we just need you to help us transfer it. Can you send us fifteen hundred dollars and then you'll wind up with fifteen million? You know? Exactly, like, it's exactly. crazy. And Kira noticed at first that things weren't adding up. And you know when she went to deposit these checks, get this, she noticed it was he said it was a female's check, like a female had written him this check. Mm -hmm. but it looked like his handwriting, like a male's handwriting. And the signature on it was Acacia herself, apparently. So he was using his prior victim's names to continue on to other crimes. Now, regardless, the check was put on hold. It was fraudulent, but still. Within one month, Acacia was able to take the victim count from eight to 18. That was way past the two that the detective needed to push the case. But despite all of this, the case just didn't move forward. Acacia ended up having to travel for civilian work in the Air Force, which she did from time to time, and that left nobody to push the detective, so the case went back to being stagnant. But when Acacia returned and there was no arrest at all, she put up quite the demand. I think she's pretty ballsy for doing this. She I think she's up, awesome. She's, she's awesome up, with the internet. Oh, yeah. She went up to the detective and said, if I don't have evidence that Wilson's been arrested by April 1st, I'm filing a severe complaint against you. Wow. <laughs> And the detective did just what she said. Just days before Acacia's deadline, the detective saw that Wilson had recently been arrested for auto theft, and he had an upcoming court date. So being curious about this, she decided to call the detective working on that case, and the story behind it was the exact thing that they needed to push this all the way through. So back in January of that year, so just a few months prior, Will had conned a woman named Anna Martinez. Same old story, met her online, flew her in for a date from San Jose, his debit card was messing up, so she ended up paying for the rental car at the airport. They had dinner, went to his place, and the next morning, Anna felt like something was wrong. His behavior had shifted. He kept saying, you have to leave right now, we have to hurry up and go, Um, this is important, you need to leave, and he was supposed to take her back to the airport, they were supposed to drop this car off and go, and he was so angry that she wouldn't hurry as fast as he needed her to that he actually got in the rental car and left her there with no drive to the airport, so she had to call an Uber. Now, when she got back to San Jose, she's thinking, okay, I need to call the rental company and make sure that this car was actually returned. Sure enough, it was not. (laughs) And so then her next step was to cancel all of her credit cards, except she left one open. And sure enough, within days, that one card was used for a flight from Chicago to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Also, movie tickets. (laughs) It's the same story each time. And this time, he even went a step further by getting himself a Netflix subscription with his real name. So just as Acacia had done, she did some sleuthing with his real name, saw that he had been doing this to women for years. So she reported this to police and she started to post warnings all over social media about this man. And that ended up leading more victims to come to her. So we have victims coming to Acacia. She's a victim. Acacia's a victim. It's just crazy. So authorities decided that they were going to keep looking out for him, looking out for this rental car. And within a few weeks, they were able to find Wilson and this car, and he was arrested. Now, authorities decided that after his court appearance, he would be fully arrested for this entirely separate investigation, charged with two or 22 felony counts of identity theft, fraud, forgery, and grand theft auto. And that is exactly what happened on May 24th, 2019. He was arrested. I think he walked out of his one court appearance and immediately was cuffed again. (laughs) 
he was held at, I've seen $270,000 bond. I've also seen $300,000, but even that ended up being a very sensitive sore subject because the judge questioned, you know, is this is this money yours? Like if you do offer up this money for, right. you know, bond, how do I know it's not a victim's money? Yeah, I've got 15 credit cards to put that on here. Exactly. Yeah. So they, they were trying to make sure, you know, if they didn't get this bond, it wasn't stolen money. And to no surprise, that's exactly what he tried to do. Yeah. The night that he was arrested, he was supposed to, get this, go on a second date with a woman from New York. Now, first of all, I have no clue how it even got that far. Mm-hmm. But instead, he called her, canceled, and asked her for money. Now, I have no clue if he disclosed that it was for, you know, his bond and that he'd been arrested. My guess is that he lied, but she did end up seeing reports all over about his arrest and what he was arrested for. So she did not give him the money, thank goodness. But if that doesn't go to show you, this man is quite literally charged with over 20 felonies, you know, and he immediately uses a phone call to call someone to try to calm them right Mm -hmm. after being charged with felonies for conning women. (laughs) It's his job. It's exactly. it's his yeah, it's his way of getting what he needs and that's it's his first go to and wow. Wow. And he he would come up with the most ridiculous responses, you know, when asked all these questions and are you responsible for this and this and that? And he would say that, no, 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 that detective that's been working on this, she's been harassing my family and that's not fair. These women are just fabricating stories. And he said, and I quote, and this is going to make so many of your stomach turn, stomachs turn. He said, if a woman was victimized, why didn't she come forward before? (laughs) Because you shut down the account and started a new name. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. In total from, and this is just a portion of it, 2002 to 2012. So not even from 2012 to 2019 when he was arrested. He had around 75 separate charges and multiple counties. The charges went from fraud to grand theft auto to actually half of them being felonies. And he somehow managed to escape escape all of this until 2019 when Acacia finally brought all this to light. He had four different felonies in Orange County, Florida that never even went to trial because he would pay off um, checks. He would make plea deals. He would sweet talk the judges. He would get caught for taking this money from women and he would say, oh, well, yeah, but I'm like in poverty and I have no way to pay this. Like I felt like I had to to survive and they would feel bad for him and let him go. Mm. It was really bad. And, you know, even worse, like the women's statements usually were just brushed off and the cases were thrown aside because they would claim there was a lack of investigative leads with the women standing right there with, you know, bank statements and, you know, receipts and messages and absolutely everything. Yeah. He just perfectly knew how to con everyone. One of his girlfriends that he was with for a period of time, actually, he had a child with her, and she said that, and I quote, he would shed his skin and morph into somebody else. He could pretty much morph into any situation. Wow. LAPD Captain Lillian Carranza said, and I quote, he played to the commonalities. If you were religious, he would talk about how he was into church. If you were working out, he would send those specific pictures. Oh, you have a business? I'm a business owner. It was the perfect crime. At his arrest, over 30 women had come forward as victims. Multiple women actually claimed to have children by him from their one-night date from hell. Uh All of them demanded DNA testing to be done because not only had he scammed them out of thousands, but now they're raising his children alone with no help. There was a Lyft driver, the manager at his dentist's office, a cop, a well-known state attorney. Um, You know, it was found that the money he had taken from these women were used for purchasing clothes, all these designer clothes. He would also pay his personal bills, however, apparently not his rent because he owed his landlord $12,000. His preliminary hearing was on January 11th of this year where he pled not guilty after rejecting a plea deal that would have given him seven years in prison. And he seems to genuinely believe that he can convince the judge that he's not guilty. And at this point... There are 60 women that have come forward, and women are still coming forward. So the victim count has doubled. If he was having women over, if you think about it, for one night at a time, and he's been doing this since the early 2000s, yeah, yeah. there's no telling. Yeah. And he's even claimed he's going to write a book. Not sure what about. If he's about to, if he's about to think that he's going to make money <laughs> writing a book about how he conned people out of money, I'm going to scream. <laughs> Seriously, seriously. Uh, but talk about a date from hell. And a huge shout out, seriously, to Emily Sugarman. She did an amazing article um, for the Daily Beast. Amazing write-up on this, as well as the Los Angeles Times, Newsweek.com, ABC News Go, and ABC 15. 
I have to say with Acacia's skills using Google Maps, mm-hmm. she definitely has a future as a psychic. 100%. <laughs> Absolutely. Like without a doubt. Troy, she's she's coming after your job, buddy. She's good with Google Maps. You better watch Great out. with Google Maps. <laughs> um, wow. Like this isn't... This story isn't about one of the worst dates ever. It's just all of them. Yeah, all it's of all them. of them. Yeah, and, and and we don't even have a count. I mean, can you imagine at some point that this guy can get into the court process and actually think back and say, oh, wow, I should have taken that seven years because now there's 120 different defendants I that I, I mean. Well, I genuinely think... I don't know if there's something psychological happening there. I, he genuinely seems to believe that he's not doing, not that he's not doing anything wrong, but I don't know if he's so used to sweet talking everyone. I mean, think about it at this point, he had what, 70 over 75 felony charges that he's got himself out of. How does that happen? Yeah. Yeah. He's obviously a a people person in some way. Exactly. And so if you've gone your whole entire life so far, and you have managed to talk your way out of everything. I genuinely think it's like created a complex in his brain where he does not think he can be held responsible for anything. It's it's interesting, though, because I've known people, I've seen people around my life that take advantage of women and lean on them mm-hmm. and use them up for all their resources and then break up with them. But it's like he's escalated all that with this theft mentality where he's just like like um get in take whatever i'm going to take and get out Mm -hmm. it's it's a bit of a different mechanism than i've heard of before for guys that typically do this kind of thing but wow and it's scary too because imagine how a lot of these women felt because he would still swoon them while they were with him he didn't want them to know anything until they were thousands of miles away right and so they're leaving thinking oh my goodness like what if they're like oh he's an awesome guy you know and he he would trick so many people into thinking he that he was great he was so well off he owned no businesses he had no job he even used some of that money to pay for like business licenses well and he evolved his methods yeah yeah, I mean, like you were you were talking about, I mean, essentially he started getting caught in Florida, so then he jumps, but then now he's starting to think of, well, I better not deal with people that are local, so I'm going to start reaching out to women that are in other states, and then you get this whole thing going where you fly him in for a yep. weekend. Online and getting is terrifying. Yeah, and you know, the thought of taking pictures of all the credit cards in their wallet and stuff, mm-hmm. I mean, it's th- that would absolutely do it. There's mm-hmm. so many things that you can purchase nowadays just by having that information and maybe a little personal information, which it might be a, a, a part of the reason why he's buying their plane ticket, because maybe he needs to get like their home address or their personal details, you know, their date of birth and all that yeah. kind of stuff to buy the plane ticket. Well, yeah. And he, um, would, he would talk to these women for weeks, sometimes months before actually like inviting them over for like their first big real date. And so, he, oh, sure. and of course they're not going to know much of anything. He keeps them at arm's reach. He fakes right. a life that he thinks they would like to hear to get him more information about them. And then gone well, and they know well, nothing. And he's got because of his mechanism being so tight in terms of his window of opportunity to commit his crimes and get out the the footwork he has to do before that is obviously more considerable so that's why he's going to build up that relationship re- relationship take all that time get the story right so that this weekend makes sense oh, yeah. and then pull it off oh yeah. my goodness madness amazing <laughs> Wow, Danielle, really, really good story, but we've got one more to get to, and we're going to do that right after this short break. Since I found HelloFresh, cooking at home has never been so easy, fun, and delicious. HelloFresh delivers a box right to my door with step-by-step recipes and pre-measured ingredients, everything I need to pull together a delicious meal in about 30 minutes. They even have quick recipe options that only take 20 minutes. I've become a better husband thanks to HelloFresh. Now when I cook, we don't have to worry about a bland, overcooked meal. I just follow the steps, use the fresh, high-quality ingredients, and we have a super flavorful meal. Plus, I get some extra brownie points. We had salsa verde enchiladas that were amazing, and it was great knowing they kept my allergies in mind and out of my meals. Are you a vegetarian or looking for low calorie meals? They've got you covered. HelloFresh wants to make your life easier, easily change your delivery days, food preferences, and even skip a week if you need to. 
HelloFresh is also focused on giving back. In 2019, they donated over two and a half million meals to charity, and this year they're donating even more due to the crisis. We have to support great companies that give back like that. HelloFresh also has an amazing offer for you, our listeners. Go to HelloFresh.com forward slash 80 crime after crime and use code 80 crime after crime to get a total of $80 off, including free shipping on your first box. Additional restrictions apply. Please visit HelloFresh.com for more details. Get contactless delivery right to your doorstep and skip that trip to the grocery store. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 80CrimeAfterCrime and use code 80CrimeAfterCrime to get a total of $80 off, including free shipping on your first box. Try HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit today. Danielle, we have some amazing sponsors that support multiple episodes, and one of my favorites is back. Mint Mobile is here to help people out there who are still paying inflated prices and hidden fees on their cell phone service. You could be paying just 15 bucks a month with Mint Mobile. With Mint Mobile, you get great network coverage at literally a fraction of the cost. The activation process is easy. With just a few minutes of your time, you can save literally hundreds of dollars a year. I've tested it for myself, two phones, side by side, one on my old service, the other on Mint Mobile. Connection strength, sound quality, and even internet speeds were identical. They keep their costs down by handling everything online and then pass the savings on to you. The future of wireless cell phone service is finally here. Every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text. Don't pay for unlimited data that you're not using. Find the perfect size data plan, choose between 3, 8, or 12 gigabytes of 4G LTE data. The average American only uses 4 to 5 gigs monthly. You can also bring your old phone number over to Mint Mobile. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash crime after crime. That's mintmobile.com slash crime after crime. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash crime after crime. Start saving right now with Mint Mobile. Welcome back and please support these amazing companies that believe in crime after crime. And on that note, I am so interested to hear what your story is, John, because I know what the research process was like. <laughs> yes. It was, like. it was difficult. <laughs> it was a challenging one for sure. Um, but I feel like I've got a fun story, and I'll be happy with that, Danielle. If I only get 17% of the vote, I'm just going to be content with that. Just know um, that I'm, I'm, I'm one of those one of those 17%. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks, Danielle. <laughs> I need all the help I can get. This is a story I like to call Swipe Right or Swipe Theft. Oh, no. Dr. Same Now wrote an article on Psychology Today titled, The Male Criminal's Choice of Women. In the piece, which for some reason sounds like it's written by a James Bond villain, he states, The ultimate male chauvinist is the person with a criminal personality. Inasmuch as the world revolves around him, or so he believes, a woman is to do his bidding. He is to have his wishes met. He is not to be challenged. In fact, he may refer to a female as his woman as though she is a possession, and he treats her as such. Some criminals find women who are very much like themselves. These relationships are unstable and often explosive as each struggles to control the other. The relationships usually are short-lived. <laughs> and that was, uh, I paid for that background sound effect of the thunder. <laughs> because it's a Bond villain. Uh, I think he makes some interesting points that actually parallel my story today. Mm -hmm. And while some male criminals do find women that way, others just use Tinder. Those relationships can also wind up in struggles to control each other, hint, hint, and may also be short-lived, as in one day. Oh boy. Yeah, that's pretty short. <laughs> <laughs> it's Monday, December 5th, 2016, in North Attleboro, Massachusetts. Around 3 p.m., a man walks into Bristol County Savings Bank. He's wearing a large gray jacket with black trim and a black beanie. He's initially wearing sunglasses, but making no real effort to cover up his face. He actually removes them as he approaches. He walks up to the teller, who is behind a complete wall of bulletproof glass. He's here to make a withdrawal but he doesn't reach for his ATM card. 
His hand goes into his jacket and he pulls out a 44 Magnum. That is a serious handgun, basically like a small cannon yeah, with really. a pistol grip. Yeah. He says he's in a bad way and demands cash from the teller. He also tells them not to call police or he will shoot any responding officers directly in the face. Obviously, considering the safety of the customers and other citizens not behind bulletproof glass, the teller complies and gives him 10 $100 bills. He runs out the door with $1,000 over to a nearby area called Mason Field and into an idling Nissan Maxima. He apparently had a getaway driver and it was their time to shine. Police officer Benjamin Grasso is at the park and spots the man run to the car and then the car pulling off. The escape had a few problems, though. Number one, this was very close to Falls Elementary School that was just about to let out for the day. Oh, the no. streets were clogged with parents waiting to pick up their children. School speed limit zones. I mean, that's just the worst. <laughs> yeah, well, and if you've been ever. there before school lets out, you know, you've got all those cars just stopped, even where they're not supposed to exactly. be parked. They're, yeah, they're just stopped and waiting for their kids. All rules are thrown out the window at that point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Captain Joseph Dorenzo of the North Attleboro Police Department commented, I think that helped us, to be honest, the traffic at the school. Possibly to find a way around the traffic, the car pulled into the parking lot of a Dunkin' Donuts. And so far, they were only about 1,500 feet away from where the actual robbery took place. Oh, good grief. Number two thing to go wrong? The police captain was coincidentally very close to the Dunkin' Donuts. Now, I would make think, a joke, but I'm not going to. I was going to say, I'm not going to make the joke, but I know we're all thinking it. Um, Officer Grasso came across the radio with the description of the man and the car, and Captain Dorenzo heard it. Grasso was in his squad car and closing in on the vehicle. The captain had also heard about the details of the robbery and the promise that the robber made to shoot any law enforcement. Captain Dorenzo pulled into the parking lot and saw the car. He parked and demanded the man get out of the car over a loudspeaker. The driver, a woman, ran out of the car, but the man stayed in and ducked down. Captain Dorenzo cautiously approached and saw the man trying to stuff something under the front seat. It was his beanie, and the police captain caught a glimpse of the gun going under the seat with it. Mm. Busted. <laughs> yeah, it was a little scary to see, Dorenzo said, referring to the threats made back in the bank. So I grabbed his hand to get him to come out, and that's when he started resisting. We He wouldn't go to the ground, uh, the captain continued. Luckily, at this point, Officer Grasso showed up and helped restrain the man. After they put the robber in the back of a police cruiser, he kept banging his head against the divider. At the police station, the man continued to be resistant and smashed his head into cement. The man and woman would not explain why they pulled into the Duncan parking lot. I am not sure why they stopped there. It wasn't far at all, Captain Dorenzo later stated. He continued, I can't tell you how proud Chief Riley and I are of the quick response and bravery of these officers that were involved. Their quick thinking, alertness, and professionalism led to an arrest of a very dangerous individual. I'm telling you, because if I knew as a police officer that someone threatened to shoot me directly in the face if I approached them, like, yeah. obviously they're in the face of danger every day. But if I were the first person to see that person, I'd be like, ooh, this is... Yeah, yeah. and maybe it's you're a... going to come out of that alive. Right. Maybe it's a good thing that it was someone as experienced as a mm -hmm. captain to be handling that yeah, situation. Exactly. That worked out perfect. Yeah. But he's even saying, I mean, he was, yeah. he was scared basically walking up on that. Oh, that as, makes and me then, sad. yeah. And then seeing the gun, um, the robber was found to have a criminal record in four States, including convictions for larceny and domestic violence. He is now facing new charges of armed robbery, assault and battery on a police officer. The woman that was driving was charged with being an accessory. Didn't the police do a great job? The end. Something. What? Something's missing here. Oh, oh. <laughs> Was I supposed to tell a story about the worst date ever? Yes. Well, we have to look at this same occurrence through the eyes of 40-year-old single mom Shelby Sampson, the woman in the driver's seat. Oh, no, John. <laughs> yeah. You see... When she makes her court appearance, we hear a very different story. 
According to court documents, she told police that she had just met the robber, a 33-year-old man named Christopher Castillo, through an online dating site. The day of the robbery, she met him in person for the first time ever. It was over at his parents' house in Rhode Island, about 30 miles away from the location of the robbery. Must be pretty serious if you're meeting the parents on date number one. Right, Danielle? I was about to say. Okay. Moving a little quick here, but, you know, teach their own. Or maybe Christopher was living in their basement. Those details are unclear. (laughs) Later that afternoon, Shelby had to go pick up her son from school at Falls Elementary. You're kidding me. And Christopher decided he was going to come along with her. Warning sign number one, ladies. As he got into the car, Shelby noticed that he had a gun. She demanded that he get rid of it. Chris left the car and came back supposedly unarmed. She drove about 30 miles north towards the school, and on the way, Christopher decided to make this date special. Warning sign number two, he brought some wine and drank it while they were driving. (laughs) While we're on the drive, let's have a toast. (laughs) Yeah, why not? (laughs) To great great first date, starting off in my parents' basement. Now I accidentally brought a gun. Now let's just have some wine in our car. Why not? He's not driving. I'm going to have some wine. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I don't think he offered her any, thankfully. That's good. Uh, Shelby, or or maybe that's bad. Maybe he's rude for not offering. She might have needed it. Yeah, seriously. Uh, Shelby parked the car at Mason Field, which was across from the school, and waited for her son, like all the other parents in the area were doing. Christopher left the car. Moments later, he ran back towards the car and jumped in. Warning sign number three. He was apparently covered in sweat and told Shelby he had just hit a bank and to effing go. I don't think my body would work at that point. Like, it, I think it would be one of those things where, like, excuse me, I might I might need you to repeat <laughs> yourself while my body, like, catches up to what's happening. I wouldn't be able to do anything but sit and stare. How do you even process that? I have no idea. The guy jumps out of the car. He's gone a couple minutes. He comes running back, covered in sweat. And, oh, I've hit a bank. Go. Go. Drive now, quick. (laughs) So she drove off, but she quickly noticed there were blue lights coming up behind her, realizing she was on a terrible first date from the three obvious warning signs. Yes. (laughs) Shelby pulled over where she knew the squad car would be sure to follow. Smart decision. The Dunkin' Donuts parking lot. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely go here. (laughs) Okay, we're going to go there this time, yeah. (laughs) Uh, sorry, just couldn't help myself. That's too good. As Christopher was being pulled from the car, he spit on the officers and yelled, the gun isn't even loaded. Of course, after guzzling that wine and considering the way he was acting, it seems like the only thing loaded was Christopher. Mm-hmm. He then continued with the head pounding in the back of the squad car and at the police station, racking up more charges. The officers found the stolen thousand dollars in Christopher's wallet and the gun turned out to be an antique owned by Christopher's father. Quote, the female driver of the Maxima gave a statement to police that she had met the defendant through an online dating app and had just met him in person for the first time that day. Bristol, Bristol District Attorney Thomas M. Quim III. Wow, Why the name? Why the name? <laughs> yeah, uh, his office said in a statement. She panicked and drove off, but when she saw the blue lights of the police cruisers, she immediately pulled into the parking lot and got away from the car. Shelby wound up facing no charges. The initial charges of acting as an accessory were dropped. Thank goodness. Yeah. Christopher pled guilty to armed robbery, three counts of assault and battery on an officer and battery of a police officer. In February of 2020, he was sentenced to three years in prison with two additional years being served after that in jail, specifically for his attacks on the officers. This is an aggressive, aggressive man. Yeah, but it's also pretty aggressive sentencing. I mean, it was a thousand dollars, and yeah. but he stole from a bank. That's that's part of the problem. But then they've got the police, the assault and battery yeah. charges that they're basically stacking. They're not letting him serve time at the same time yeah. for that. So um, he was also sentenced to a lifetime of becoming a viral internet story. Well, that's what you get. Yeah, this past Valentine's Day, hundreds of sites in different languages all over the world retold the story of the woman who was turned into a getaway driver on her first date. Now, Danielle, do you think that Shelby's going to wait until Christopher gets out in 2025 for her second date? 
Oh, or good grief. Maybe we can hook Shelby up with a different Christopher. I hear your tango.com expert Christopher Smith is available. <laughs> I mean, if she has a thanks Christopher, she might as well go for it, you know? Yeah. Because, I mean, after all, Christopher Smith said, give people a second chance. So she might go back to the other Christopher. We never know. Maybe. It's all Maybe. up in the air. <laughs> I just hope that if you uh, date any of these or either of these guys that uh, you don't mind your phone calls being recorded and having to pay for them <laughs> on your end. Thank you, Psychology Today, the Boston Globe, the Sun Chronicle, WHDH.com and CNN for information contributing to today's story. And I truly hope that Shelby has learned some lessons about online dating and maybe we can all learn from her experience. Man, see, what's so scary about that to me, first of all, is I feel like that's the perfect situation for like a very like pushover kind of person or like the people who are like people pleasers. You know, yeah. you meet someone online, you're not expecting them to be a bad person, but it's like, if it's something like, oh, that's small, like, it's at your parents' house, like, that's a little, you know, you never know with that, right, um, right. you know, and then, oh, you brought a gun, you know, some people just carry, and that could be, I'm being serious, especially like around where I live, that would be fairly yeah. normal to see. I mean, people are open carrying all around Walmart here, and so, yeah. like, that could easily be something that's like, oh, that's strange, but like... Oh, man, all those things coming together and all of a sudden he's robbing a bank. And what is so I'm so thankful for is that her son had not been in his car or her car yet. I was wondering about that, too. Had a child been involved? I was waiting and hoping you were not going to say that her kid was in the car. No, thankfully, no. But what was the plan here? I mean, he was driving out there with her. He knew she was going there. Yeah, under the presumption that she was going to have to get her son. Like, what, were they going to hit the bank, drive around the block a couple times, and then pick up her son? Like, what was he thinking? It reminds me so much of my story, too, like the thought process. There seems to be none. It's very, like, it's only about them. It's like, it does not matter who shows up, what the circumstances end up being. Like, the end result, that's all they care about. does not matter the noise happening around it. And people like that scare the crap out of me. Yeah, it's just so clear that there was, this is such an impulse thing that's Mm -hmm. going on. I mean, there's actually a picture, and we'll show it on the YouTube version of him, and you can see the teller is completely protected. Like, there's no threat to the teller going on there at all. But And even with what he he made off with, $1,000? I know, I I was about to say. What the heck? Is he looking to have a nice weekend, and then he's going to hit a bank after that? I know, you never know. Um, so yeah, there was nothing well thought out about this on any level and, you know, five years for going through that three years for the actual robbery, two more years for fighting with the cops. These I don't know. dating apps and websites are so scary. And especially the dating apps, in my opinion, you're way too accessible on things like that. And you know, it's, I mean, it's got a reputation for you literally go on there and again, swipe right, swipe left, you know, nothing about this person. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're meeting them in like an hour. It's terrifying. You're just yeah. like fish in a barrel wait, <laughs> waiting for the right person to come and snag you up. Right. Uh, that's actually a great transition into our extra stories segment. I've got one that I want to share with you guys um, because I can't tell you how many different versions of this story that I'm seeing. And I think there's definitely some lessons we can get from this. Uh, This one is literally from only a few days ago. A man in California used an app called Meet Me to meet up with Shalena Lopez at a casino for their first date. At the casino, they bump into an alleged family member of hers and then later another friend of theirs. They all wind up heading home together in the man's car, just him and three people that he just met that day. There's a gunshot. Thankfully, it's not him being shot, but they wanted it to be clear that this was a stick up. They force him to stop in an ATM and withdraw money and give them all of his valuables. They then had him drop them off somewhere and they got out and they let him go. Thankfully, he calls the cops and the woman and her family member are immediately arrested. The other guy goes on the run. But this is a really typical story that I'm seeing, Danielle. There's, um, it's weird. I wrote down, it's almost like there's someone selling pamphlets, you know, how to make money with dating apps. It's the same setup of meet a person, come meet me somewhere. And then a third person is brought into the situation and those two people rob the other. It's crazy. And there is, there's so many articles. I can't even tell, I can't even get a decent count on it. It's ridiculous. It's just, Um, it's that scary, like 
limbo just like with my just like with my man you know he yeah he perfected it like keep yourself at an arm's length so they know nothing about you but you're very prepared for what you're gonna do oh right right yeah well danielle you got a story for us i sure do now this one this one's a bit on the funnier side and i saw this and good grief if this isn't a nightmare it's always great when a first date goes well but what do you do when your date won't leave (laughs) So far, we have all these people running from their dates, but this woman was determined to stay. Uh Uh-oh. 29-year-old Lindy from Houston, Texas, ended up on a date with successful 49-year-old former Marine and high-profile attorney Tony Busby. And some of you out there might recognize him. He has a tendency of getting himself into bad, bad positions. Okay. (laughs) Oh, yeah. If anyone looks him up, you're going to be like, this man... But while there has been some back and forth on, you know, if this was actually a date or not, he apparently tried to cover up some things after the fact. A very intoxicated Lindy went on a date with Busby. They ended up back at his mansion in River Oaks, the neighborhood. Now, huge house. And when Busby realized how intoxicated this woman was and he called an Uber to send her home, she saw this, freaked out, refused to leave, ran and hid inside of his mansion. (laughs) <laughs> Just went in there. There's no telling where she could be. I mean, I would have had a heart attack. Busby couldn't locate her for quite some time, and eventually he just resorted to calling another Uber, and he screamed out, you know, Hey, Lindy, <laughs> I called you another Uber. It's time for you to leave now. And in an absolute rage, she ran out from her hiding spot. She pulled multiple paintings off of Busby's walls, dousing them in red wine while chucking sculptures across the room. I mean, full-on went from zero to 100. She wow. did, in fact, obviously end up being arrested, and it was found that she did well over $300,000 worth in damage to, get this, original Andy Warhol paintings, oh my a Monet, God. and many more. I don't know if the sculptures were of any large significance other than just being expensive sculptures. And I've actually seen that it was, I think some of the paintings alone were well over 200,000, but that was just the 300,000 was just what they ended up charging her with. Now I know that she did fight the charges, but I haven't seen an outcome of the case. Well, I have to say that's definitely a good point for anyone thinking about getting a mansion out there. If you don't want your crazy date hiding in your mansion, (laughs) don't do that. Yeah. Don't do it. (laughs) Just, just get a regular house and don't put Andy Warhols up. Uh huh. Oh, my goodness. Don't want to risk it. (laughs) Wow. Well, I wanted to end on a little bit of a lighter note. Crimes can also be stopped on dates, as we learn in this last story. Earlier this year, two married off-duty police officers, Chase and Nicole McCowan, were on a date in Kentucky and went to a chicken restaurant. Can you guess the name of the restaurant, Danielle? No. Kentucky... Chicken. Oh, I was about to say Kentucky Fried Chicken. Nope, nope. It's actually called Kane's Chicken Fingers. <laughs> oh, uh, disappointing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Total letdown. Uh, the couple loves to eat there because it's where they went after their wedding. A man came in wearing a white mask and a black hoodie, and he pulled a gun out of his shorts. The couple noticed the cashier holding up her hands. They knew they had to act quickly, and thankfully, they were both armed. With two guns pointed at him, the man dropped his and took off out the door. They ran him down. He obviously had no idea one of the officers was literally named Chase. (laughs) and Born ready. (laughs) He was born ready. And they detained him until Louisville Metro Police officers could arrive. The man was charged with robbery and receiving a stolen gun. Good grief. I'm telling you what. See, if I were ever crazy enough to rob anything, that would be my luck. I would rob somewhere that's like, just so happens to be like a police officer convention. (laughs) I'm like, oh, this was a bad decision. Okay, so we've learned two things. Danielle, don't get a mansion. And uh, yeah, don't. How about you just stay out of crime altogether? Yeah, probably not a great decision for me anyways. (laughs) No, you guys. Who do you think is going to win this month? And this is important. Okay? It's very important this month. So it you, is. you guys get to vote who had the best worst date ever story. That sounded weird, but, you know, it is what it is. 
Yeah, the best, right, the best worst. The best worst date. <laughs> <laughs> you can vote on our Twitter account at Crime After Pod, and you can vote there for seven days after the episode drops. Or you guys can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there. We have a link in the description box below. You can still click the I like you used to be able to. It's just going to direct you to that website. You guys have done awesome so far. Plenty of you figured it out last time, and I'm really excited about that. At crimeaftercrimepodcast.com, you can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics, join our Patreon, or shop our Teespring store where you could be a winner every month with your own Crime After Crime mug. And as always, a huge thank you to our patrons. You guys are absolutely amazing. We love spending a day a month with you guys. Plus, Patreons get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly. Dead in the center of the month. It's more content from us. And you guys can get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. All right. Next episode is our anniversary special number two. Now, last time we did Florida Man. This time we're doing Florida Woman. Oh, boy. This is going to be a good one. <laughs> I'm so and excited. And, of course, also announcing the winner of season two. We'll see if the season of Revenge came through or if Danielle holds on to the title. I feel like I'm going to win. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> I have to, you might. I have to put these things out into the universe for them to happen. <laughs> have you ever watched the movie or read the book The Secret? Yes. You have yes, to do Absolutely. <laughs> you have to I can tell it. you it's not working at all because I feel like you're going to win too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. There's no telling. You always come back when I don't expect it. Oh, uh, we'll see. <laughs> but you guys, this is produced and hosted by me, Daniel Hallen, and John Lorden. If you enjoyed the show, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And the best way you can help others find us is to tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone that you love crime after crime. See you guys next time. Bye-bye.